again because it has such um, uh, pertinent information uh, to us in society today. Everything that happened to the nation of Israel during this time is happening to the United States of America. It's happening to the world and it's happening to the church. Um, so we've got a lot to cover tonight. Let's uh, ask the Lord's blessing upon his word. Father, uh, we do commit now this time of study and um, I guess worship um, as we worship you in the word of God. And we ask, Lord, that you would uh, teach us everything that we need, uh, I guess, to walk away tonight with something, Lord, that will affect us for the better as uh, born-again Christians. And, uh, Lord, we'll be sure to give you all the praise and the glory for it. Help us to understand what we need to understand now by your Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me make sure this thing's on. It is. Okay. So let's look at verse 1 now. Again, we introed our way in. It was a long message. It was uh, a rough message. Um, and I don't suspect they're going to get much better from here as far as uh, lacking roughness. Uh, verse 1 says, Now after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall go up for us against the Canaanites first to fight against them? So let's start out with this uh, doctrinal application. Moses represents what in Scripture? Anyone know? What is he a type of? Moses? He is a type of Christ, but what is, he, what is his greatest representation? It's not Christ. It's that of the law. He gave the law of Moses, right? Uh, the law or the word of God. That's what he represents in Scripture. Who does Joshua represent? That's, yeah, that's absolutely Jesus. In fact, his name is Joshua. And I want to show you. Go to Acts chapter 7. We'll go to one of those famous places in Scripture that all of the commentators or those that don't have a King James Bible complain about the King James Bible having a mistake in it. And I understand why they would come to that conclusion here. I really do. But if you approach the Bible with the eyes of faith rather than, you know, criticism, textual criticism. I think God is willing to show you a little bit more. You've just got to be willing to humble yourself. And then he'll show you these things. And I think he does this on purpose. I really do. As uh, Isaiah 28 says that, um, you know, he'll, uh, your, his word is like a snare, that you may go and fall backwards and be snared and taken. That's why he made it line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. But Acts chapter 7, verses 44 and 45 say this. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen, which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David. What is this even talking about here? Does anyone know? It's when they came out of Egypt and got into the promised land, the Gentiles' land. Right? Who went with them, according to verse 45? Jesus. Do you know every modern Bible makes that Joshua? Do you know why? Because there's no... Well, Jesus wasn't there. Joshua was there. Joshua's the one that brought them in the land. That can't be right. You see, yeah, it's verse 45. Verse 45, it says, Jesus came with Jesus. Are we having trouble? You see it? Verse 45. Yours says Joshua? Throw that thing out. Acts 7.45? Does anyone else have Joshua? Yeah, no. I don't know what you got there, my dear. <laughs> that, that was a publisher going, boy, God screwed that up. Yeah, no. See, what you have, I'm glad, that's actually glad that you, I'm glad, you know. 
Yeah, okay, that doesn't matter. You know, King, publishers of King James Bible don't believe the King James Bible. They publish it to make money. Sure. Yeah. Get yourself a, a Ruckman or a Hoffman or a Schofield. You know, I mean, hey, it's, you know, if the, that book's precious to you. I'm sure there's, you know, you got a lot of memories to it, but I'm, I'm, that's wrong. What they got there is absolutely wrong. What it is, is it's the name, it's a, it's a Greek name, Iesus. That's Jesus. Everywhere it's translated in the New Testament, it's translated as Jesus. Until they get here, because they can't believe that that's Jesus. So then they go to uh, a Hebrew form, which would be Yeshua, and they say, no, it's Joshua. Because they got to cover up God's mistakes. Yeah. Joshua never appears as such in the New Testament. It always appears as Jesus because their names are synonymous. It's Yeshua in the Old Testament, which we would say is Joshua, and Jesus in Greek, which is Joshua, but it's Jesus. And both mean Savior. So... Again, the NIV, they freak out, error, error, you know. You, no, listen, if, 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 you've got, if you've got Joshua in there, you're going to miss the typology. And that's why this is so important. See, Moses, again, he is a type of the law. And as a type of the law, he could not bring the Jews into the promised land. The law can't get you there. You need the captain of the host. You need the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Joshua was a type of Jesus. He was the one that was able to finally make that go. They tried. They tried to get there. Their religion. They had the religion first. By the way, the law came before Jesus came. At least as far as in the flesh. So that's the typology there. They couldn't get in under the law of Moses. They could only get in under the deliverer, Joshua. Uh, so now... That said, when Moses and Joshua were absent, verse 1, Israel falls into apostasy. When Moses and Joshua were present, Israel, though, uh, or through accountability, always stayed the course. So that brings us to the practical application. Go to Exodus chapter 32. Exodus 32. How about that, Kim? Uh, what is that, uh, a Nelson? Shame on them. All right, uh, in chapter 32 of the book of Exodus, let's look at the first six verses here. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us, for as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and your daughters, and bring them unto me. See, they were getting their ears pierced back then too, even the dudes were. Verse 3, And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand, and fashioned it with a graving tool, and after that he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Isn't that interesting? He made a calf and said, Let's make a feast unto the Lord. Well, there's Roman Catholicism right there in the text. Verse 6. And, oh, by the way, he was a priest. Go figure. Verse 6, And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Okay, so we see what happens when Moses is gone. Joshua was with them. Joshua was gone. Okay, now skip down to verses 15 through 20. And Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides uh, on the one side and on the other were they written and the tables were the work of God and the writing was the writing of God graven upon the tables and when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted he said unto Moses there is a noise of rock and roll in the camp oh I'm sorry that's how my Baptist brethren read that there's the noise of war in the camp 
And he said, It is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that, do, that sing do I hear. And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh unto the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing. And Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hands and brake them beneath the, beneath the mount. And he took the calf which he had made and burnt it in the fire and ground it to powder and strawed it upon the water and made the children of Israel to drink of it. That's a tough dude right there. I don't even know how long the process was to grind down the golden calf and make it powder and then put it in the water and force six million Jews to drink it. But he did, unless God's lying and I don't suspect that he is. So who are the two men holding them accountable? Moses and Joshua. Where's Moses and Judges? He's dead. He's gone. Where's Joshua and Judges? He gets them in and then it starts in verse 1, he's dead. So what's absent? Accountability. Yeah, it's leadership, but leadership brings accountability if you've got the right leaders in place. It, most, you know, most pastors of today do not bring accountability. You know, they got, you know, their paychecks that they're worried about and if they hold you accountable, you'll leave. So they don't. It's the whole story of judges. It's the whole story of man. Look at the 21st chapter. It's the, the very last verse of the book. And we're going to, of course, come around to this. We'll do a whole message on it. It's also found in the 17th chapter. The Lord says it twice. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Judges 21, 25 says, in, their, in those days there was no what? Who is the king? He's leadership. What is that? Accountability. In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which is right in his own eyes. That's how the book ends. How will your life end? You got a life, right? You got a life. You got a born again life. Right? Who's the king? King of my life, I crown thee now. It's supposed to be Jesus, right? But he's not here. You say, well, Moses wasn't there either, right? And that was the trouble. They, they did have the law of Moses. That's what you got. All you got left is a book. An old archaic book that apparently has lots of mistakes in it that people got to fix. How's your life going to end? That's going to depend on what accountability you let in. Are you going to let Jesus be the king through his word? Are you even going to allow a pastor to ever say anything to you? And see you in a couple of weeks, brother or sister. He's rude. All right, I don't care about you, brother or sister. Do whatever you want. You're going to anyhow, because you're going to do that which is right in your own eyes. Um, you know what, this is fun. This is a side note. Do you know what Ephesians actually teaches? Ephesians chapter 4. When it talks about he gave some apostles, some prophets, pastors, teachers, right? It goes on to say, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Do you know what that means? That you got saved by Jesus, right? Shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ made you born again. The Holy Spirit of God is living in you, right? And you'll never be perfected without a pastor. That's the Bible. Oh, I don't need a pastor. Okay. Have fun with that. You're, you're going to need a pastor. You'll never be perfected. Not on this side of eternity. But if you don't care about your perfection, well, then you don't have to worry about it, right? And the Lord will take care of that at rapture and it won't matter what you've done in this life and then you'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And all burns up and you're standing there going, what happened? 
and then the Lord will march in the pastor that you didn't listen to. Just making stuff up as I go now. Uh, back to back to judges. It's true though. How are you going to end your life? You know how's how's your book going to end? Uh, verses. Okay, verse two. Uh, no, we've got to read them in conjunction. Now, after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall go up for us against the Canaanites first to fight against them? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have delivered the land into his hand. See, it's, it's so right in God's sight. He said, I've, I've already given this to him. Judah's going to go up. It's delivered. Past tense. Right? So before we go into the preaching side of this, how did they ask? Because we want to teach through this series as well. How did they, how did they ask? Moses isn't there. Because didn't, didn't the children of Israel go to Moses? Whenever they had a question, they went to Moses for the hard questions. Of course, he had other elders and leaders in place to ask as well. You got Moses and Joshua gone. Who are they going to go to? They're going to go to the priest. Let me show you. Go to Numbers chapter 27. This is one of those strange things. I don't even know half what to do with it, to be quite honest with you. It's so weird. Um, yeah, Numbers 27, look at verse 18. You're going to see here where he's talking to, the Lord's talking to Moses, and he's talking about laying hands on the next generation so that they'll... You know, it's kind of why we lay hands on, you know, we laid hands on Pastor Joe to, to transfer of an authority. Not that, you know, I don't think I have any authority, but as a leader of the church, you have biblical authority. So he just, you know, I mean, Moses was the man. He was the guy that made everyone drink, right, the, the golden calf water. So if he lays hands on Joshua, then that, you know, says a lot as to who Joshua is going to be in the eyes of the people. The, not God doesn't need it. The eyes of the people need it. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee, Joshua, the son of Nun. That's how I like to call him. I don't know. Nun seems weird. I just don't like the word. A man, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thy hand upon him. Some of you got that. Uh, and, uh, in whom is the Spirit, and lay thine hand upon him, and set him before Eleazar the priest, and before all the congregation, and give him a charge uh, in their sight. Thou shalt put some of thine honor upon him, and all the congregation of the children of Israel may uh, that they may be obedient see that's why he's that's why they are, they need to see it and he shall stand before here's where I'm bringing you he shall stand before Eliezer the priest who shall ask counsel for him after the judgment of Urim before the Lord at his word shall they go out and at his word they shall come in both he and all the children of Israel with him even all the congregations. So Joshua's going to lead the charge. He's going to tell them when to go and when not to go. But he's going to go to the priest and get his information from the priest. The high priest wore an ephod. And it had 12 colored stones in it, all represent, representing the nation of Israel. Uh, and he wore this thing called a Urim and a Thummim. And it has nothing to do with the Book of Mormon. And they're plates of gold and all that stuff and there I mean didn't they have like urims and thummims and things that you know yeah uh -huh. and and they're able to use that you know why they're able to use that because no one actually knows what they were nobody knows what they were and if you got a commentator that says they know what they were I, you know please, you got a photo <laughs> a drawing someone's depiction something we've got what the word of God talks about it doesn't give us that that much information. We know what it means. Urim means uh, light and Thummim means perfection if you were to go to the meaning of the Hebrew word. Um, so what it's supposed to do is give you complete illumination or perfect understanding. You could look at it either way. Uh, again, we have no idea what it was. But the, the thought behind it is that with those uh, stones that they would, when a question was asked before the priest, that the stones would light up, kind of like representing different letters of the Hebrew alphabet in the same sense that, um, you know, like a telephone number. And if I were to press, you know, two, three, and four, it's got letters that are representative as well. 
beyond that as well because they all represent different tribes of Israel if the Lord said you know if the question was who's going to go up to battle well they go to the priest and then Judah would light up phone home <laughs> this is just like saying the light up I don't know it's strange but what did the what did the Lord say now that we've gotten past the the, the house sort of what did the Lord say who's going to go up Judah why Judah why first Reuben was the firstborn, right? He lost his birthright. Who did he lose it to? Not Judah. He lost it to Joseph. He lost the birthright to Joseph. But Judah was the prevailer or the preeminent one among his brethren, and there's scripture for it. It's prophecy. Genesis 49, verse 10, if you want to flip there. Let's do so quickly. I'm trying to move through this quickly. Genesis 49, verse 10. And then the, uh, the fulfillment of that is 1 Chronicles 5, if you want to get that as well. Genesis 49, 1 Chronicles 5. Genesis 49, verse 10 says, The scepter, that's, what is that? What's the scepter? Who would have a scepter? A king. A king would have a scepter. So, the authority the right to rule, the leadership, the king. That shall not depart from who? From Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And now there's a very specific reference to Jesus Christ. Shiloh, peace. Uh, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Um, now the fulfillment of that is 1, Corinthians, or 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 2. says, for Judah prevailed above his brethren, and of him came the chief ruler. But the birthright was Joseph's. So the birthright belonged to Joseph, but according to the prophecy of Genesis 49, listen, this king is going to come out of Judah. And the authority and the right to reign is going to come out of Judah. And then we even find that Judah prevailed above his brethren in the text. Okay, so far so good? All right, back to Judges. Let's look at verse 3, and we'll get to some preaching aspects here. So in verse 2, the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have delivered, past tense, the land into his hand. It's a done deal. Verse 3, And Judah said unto the Lord, Thank you, Lord. I'll, I'll go right on that right now. No. Judah said unto Simeon, his brother, come up with me into my lot that we may fight against the Canaanites and I likewise will go with thee into thy lot. So Simeon went with him. So what did Judah do? What is this? It's a compromise of the word of God. It's ever so subtle. Because he went, but the question was who's going to go first? And the answer was, Judah will go up. I've delivered it into his hand. He didn't say Judah and Simeon shall go. So what's the problem with Judah? God's word isn't enough for him. He's got a faith problem. Church has a faith problem. We see a clear-cut verse and we begin dancing around it. He had a clear-cut instruction, and he began dancing. So what did he do? Look at Proverbs 30. I'll show you this proverb here. Proverbs 30, in uh, verse 6. Is this the right reference? Yeah. Well, let's start in verse 5, because that's important. Every word of God is what? How many words of God are pure? Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their what in him? So you're going to trust in what? In his word, right? Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. What did Judah do? He said, well, God told me that it was me and Simeon. 
I just had a feeling that God really wanted me to include Simeon in on this. You know, I just got these goosebumps on the back of my neck when Simeon walked by. Like, Lord, is that, is that you're, you want me to bring? Oh, praise you, Lord. Well, we're going to bring Simeon in. I'm getting, an, I'm getting an impression, an unction from the Holy Ghost now. That's what we do. Well, hopefully that's not what we do. But that's what's done. And we do things like that too, maybe not in such a charismatic way. But we try to include people in on our battles as well. And there's ways that we can do that without compromise of the Word of God. And then there's ways that we do it and we do compromise the Word of God. Um, look at uh, Jeremiah 17, verse 5. Here's the issue with this particular situation. God says, I've delivered, past tense. And Judah didn't believe God. And, I mean, I get it. Have you ever read a Bible verse where you went, that's great, Lord. I don't know how to live that. I believe it. But I, I'm not ready for that. Well, you can honestly say, I mean, at any point in time, Judah could have gotten down on his knees and said, Lord, I'm scared. But he didn't. Instead, he began to trust in the arm of flesh. Look at uh, Jeremiah 17 and verse 5. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. So I could have trust, full trust in the Lord, and he could give me the victory. But I have a hard time trusting the one who created me. But I've got a far easier time trusting the person, I don't know, that has a little snot on his face right now. You know what I mean? I'm, that's crude, but it's the first thing that came to my crude mind. Just this imperfect man that looks like an idiot, that talks like an idiot, that walks like an idiot, that makes foolish decisions. And rather than trusting in God who never made a mistake... I'm going to trust this very flawed individual. We'll say that has a little food left on his beard. Just looking at Steve, just in case. Psalm 118, verse 8 says, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Verse 9 goes on to say, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. So let's go beyond the fact of just putting confidence in a man. How about Trump? That's right. You know, I could have said Obama, and it probably would have gotten more praise, but he's not our president. Trump is. And like him or not, that means nothing in this assembly tonight. Can't put confidence in him. Put it in the Lord. Deuteronomy 20. In case you're all worried about a president that can't keep his mouth shut. Um, listen, as a side note, maybe a political one a little bit, but as a side note, they're never going to like his speech. The left doesn't like the Lord. And I'm not saying that Trump is the Lord by any stretch of the imagination. What I'm saying is that if you lean conservative, they're not going to like you. His tweets aren't the only thing they're trying to eliminate. So just, you know, just because something is deemed as unpopular or hate speech or whatever, you know, so is this. Just, just as a side note. Just to let you know, I don't agree with everything that he tweets. In fact, I don't understand why a president's got to tweet at all. Stop tweeting. You're not a bird. Knock it off. Right? But, you know, it's the day and age in which we live, I guess. Uh, Deuteronomy 20. Just to say that when they're coming hard, when the media is coming hard against something, 
just stow that away here. Okay? Stow that away there. It's, it's not about him. It's about what he has to say. Um, verse 1. When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies and seest horses and chariots and a people more than thou, be not afraid of them. For the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. He was telling them this back in Deuteronomy. Don't be afraid. And it shall be when ye are come nigh unto the battle that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people. And she'll say, no, that's, see, this is why you need leadership. Come on, guys. You can do it. Did you see them? They're huge. You can do it. The Lord's with you. You know, you need that. We all need a pep talk from <laughs> everyone now and again, right? It shall be when ye are come nigh unto the battle that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people. And he shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, ye approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint. Fear not. Do not tremble, neither be ye terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. Yeah. So why would you then ask for help from man? This is a faith issue. Why do you ask, you know, for something to help skirt you around the word of God? Why do people come into counsel with a pastor? And if they know they got a biblical pastor, they know what he's going to say. And they're looking to have something counseled to them that they want to hear as opposed to what they know he's going to say. Well, then why are you seeking me out? Because if I agree with you in your error, I'm you in error. I'm an arm of flesh that can't help you. Right? Right. Thank you, Ryan. Verse 4. And Judah went up. Oh, Lord, help us. And the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand. And they slew of them in Bezek 10,000 men. Well, we got no problem here, right? It's okay that they didn't follow the word of the Lord perfectly, right? They still won, right? I mean, who cares? It all turned out well. Ecclesiastes 8 and verse 11 says, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is, to, is fully set in them to do evil. What does that mean? Because you, you purposely disobeyed and you didn't get punished immediately, you're totally set to disobey the next time. This is our problem. We want, as a humanity, we want instant results. But you always reap in due season the things you planted days, weeks, months, or years in advance. Um, we, as a people, won't put in the work because it doesn't yield immediate results, right? Sometimes it's like, uh, man, if I, just did, if I did that now and I had it like two seconds later, cool, right? But, oh, I got to work for 10 days to get that? So we don't want it. We don't want to put in the work. And we don't want to refrain our steps from evil because it doesn't produce immediate judgment. So we continue on that course because it feels good. But watch, skip down to verse 19 of this chapter. And the Lord was with Judah, and he drave out the inhabitants of the mountain, but could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley because they had chariots of iron. Now, we're going to talk about what chariots of iron, all that stuff is, you know, and we'll talk a little bit about it tonight, but we're going to delve into it. Um, for now, very simply, what the inhabitants of the land represent? Sins. This is, we'll just transfer this walk into the promised land. A promised land is a picture of a sanctified life. And as you're trying to get to a sanctified life, once you get in that land, there's going to be some obstacles in your way. 
those obstacles are going to be personal sins of yours. The iron chariots in the land, they're the sins that easily beset us and overpower us very quickly. And they seem like such a daunting task to have to, I can't deal with that. There's no, I'm never going to get the victory over that. So they only partially won because they were only partially obedient. And that's the lesson. So let's end with this. Let's get the big picture. The Christian life is a military campaign against spiritual wickedness in high places, the mountains, and in the valleys. Me. And even when I can get a victory over a devil, I don't always get it over me. Not your flesh. Your flesh is tough. It's the hardest thing. You need Jesus, Joshua, and his word, Moses, to succeed because you need accountability. But you've got to believe it. All of it. As it's written, without compromise, to have a full victory, not a partial victory. You can go to your friends and recruit them in this campaign, certainly for prayer, and that would be good. But the moment that you start recruiting them to fight your spiritual and physical battles, when the Lord says, I want you to go defeat that iron chariot. Well, now you're trusting in the arm of flesh instead of entrusting in Jesus to get you through it. And that is a lack of faith. Let me end with this. Don't let the partial victories lure you into false sense of comfort. They won the high places. It's good enough. Thank you, Lord. Listen, if you've compromised, but you don't yet see the judgment, give it time. Because you sowed a seed of compromise. You did not sow a seed of obedience. So you'll get that partial win, and then, of course, we'll be like, woohoo! And that lulls you in the sense of security, like, I don't have to do everything God asked me and I can still have some good times in this Christian walk. Until they of the valley rise up against you. Lord, the iron chariots! Well, you should have listened to me. Well, it looked like you gave us the victory. Yeah, you know, you're supposed to walk by faith, not by sight. And... Those of us, you know, I mean, we, a number of us went to a church together many, many years ago at uh, the First Bible Baptist Church. The whole leadership had changed over. And I remember this very um, distinctly. I was very concerned, a few of us were very concerned about the change of leadership because it was going a direction, let's just say, we didn't think was biblical. Okay? So, I was concerned for sure in but all these people kept coming and the place started packing in there and I remember a brother in the Lord look at me in the face isn't this great so, man look at how the Lord is blessing this and I thought you know I didn't say anything I just kind of nodded but I thought I don't know is it, it you know and I was still on the fence but is this blessing just because there's people here is that blessing what does that mean you know well in hindsight all those people that were there completely turned over within five years minus a family or two completely turned over wait a minute I thought the Lord was blessing with this so what, what am I getting at don't let you know, something that you can see with your eyes 
make you think a certain way about the Word of God and what you can get away with. Because it, it's, it, you know, you may five years from now be completely barren. Recognize it for what it is. Don't look at the outward appearance. You've got you to gotta walk by faith, and the faith is in the Word of God. You know, where, where there is no vision, the people will perish, right? But the vision is the Bible. That's clearly there in the context, and that's what it has to be for us. So if you're going to get any victory over your issues, and we all got them, my issues, your issues, then we need to have complete obedience, not partial obedience. And that's the lesson here. Anything uh, you guys want to ask or add there too? Before we close. Brother Joe, will you close us?